Okay. My name is John Matheson, and I'm the program chair at ISA, and I'd really like to thank you very much for, uh, for all coming um, to this event. Uh, I'd like to first, I'm going to point out our uh, president, uh, Peter. So, Peter, thank you. And, uh, and now I have the pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Patrick, Patrick Njem, and a few things about Patrick. Uh, first, uh, he works with my brother, which is how I found out he, about him. He is a Patrick. He is a Patrick attorney. He is a patent attorney with um, um, always have to look at it. Kilpatrick and Townsend, and uh, he a little bit about him. I hope it's okay. To say he started in um, grew up in Lebanon, mm -hmm. and then moved here when he was 19 years old. Went to Wazoo, Washington State, which is my alma mater as well. Go Cougs. Uh, go Cougs, yeah. So we got some cou cou cougar, uh, cougar, cougar here, um, and then uh, he studied electrical engineering, like a lot of us, and then got his master's in electrical engineering there as well. He went to work uh, for Boeing. Uh, got to work on the 787, and I'm, I really want to hear a little bit about that, uh, that 787 uh, work that he did. And then he went to uh, SPU mm -hmm. to, uh, to get his uh, law degree. Um, and now he works uh, with, um, uh, at uh, Kilpatrick and Townsend, and he does, uh, he's going to have to explain a little bit more about what he does, but it's mainly uh, well, patent litigation as well as um, prosecution. prosecution. There yes. we go. I keep Mark happy, the brother. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, and uh, everybody, let's welcome Patrick. Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to be talking about IP protection today. That's going to cover patents and other areas. Uh, before I start, kind of my presentation, how many of you have have a patent or have worked in the IP area? Cool. What What do you have? Uh, when I was at Chevron doing research, we had several products patented. Okay. For uh, oil field testing. Okay. And how how was that experience? Painful. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. That's uh, and Albert, right? Yes. Um, I have a what eighth patent. Um, okay. I started from 2011. Okay. And that time we hired a lawyer to do it for us. It's very, very costly. Yes. And then I started doing it myself. And now I find it's a very timely manner. And some that I missed the time deadline. And it costs me more. And not more, but at least get a lot of problems. Today. Okay. And were you doing that for your own company or? Yeah, for myself. Okay. It's, I patented and sometimes I spend a lot of money to make a prototype. Okay. Well, it's a very good experience, and it's with them, so. Okay, so please feel free to ask me questions today. We'll I have talk a lot of questions. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so I mostly work on patent prosecution. I do some litigation work too, but mostly I sit down with inventors, typically engineers or technical people, and walk through the process, right? I help them, I help them understand what patenting means, and also help them explain to me what their invention is. I take that information back, draft a patent application, send it back to the inventors, we kind of finalize it, and then we file it with the USPTO, and then I, we take over from that point on. We work with the USPTO to get a patent. Once that happens, if you're looking to license your patent or uh, looking to enforce your patent, we do that work too. I typically, that's not my main practice area, but we have attorneys in our offices that do that, and I help them in that effort too. So um, I was an engineer at heart, still an engineer, uh, double E, worked at Boeing for six years. I got two patents while at Boeing, and that's kind of what got me into this area. I was, um, so two kind of projects uh, um, kind of comes back to mind, but one of them is uh, I was doing uh, R&D, and uh, we wanted to install cell phones on the airplane. This is back in 05. Uh, the technology is there, but I know from social norms we cannot have cell phones on airplanes um, for different reasons. But uh, we wanted to basically install, what, what is a cell phone on the airplane, right? You have, want to have a Pico cell on the airplane, so then your phone would connect to that Pico cell, and then that Pico cell would get you off the airplane, whether over satellite, depending if you're on the, over the ocean or maybe down to some antenna on the ground, right? Um, and one of the problem is, well, if you're flying over land and you're trying to connect to that Pico cell, 
um, you're gonna, your phone's gonna see all these other antennas on the ground. You're gonna interfere with those antennas. It's gonna be a mess. Scares don't like that. So we wanted to shield the airplane basically. You wanna keep your phone from seeing the ground stations and only seeing the picos on the airplane. So we were able to come up with ways we do that. We actually worked up with the team, the F-22 team on the Boeing side that had some technology in that area and we, we worked on that, but we came up with a way you could shield the airplane so you will not have an RF signal you know, leaking out or leaking in uh, on that airplane. I also, on that project, kind of more related to, I think, some of the work that you do, um, I worked on standards. We wanted to standardize the way you install uh, Pico cells on the airplane, uh, whether it's the space on the airplane, where that space is, the interface, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the pinout, all that stuff, uh, the way you have, you connect to the flight deck, and uh, best memories, we worked with Airbus. We ended up going to Munich for Oktoberfest for a meeting there. So uh, we were able to go to Oktoberfest, have fun on the Airbus dime. Uh, but that's kind of been my Boeing experience. Um, and now that's what I do. I what is a Pico cell? Uh, it's a small cell, cell tower. Think of it as a cell tower, except small size, kind of the size of maybe, I don't know how many LRUs, but um, it, it's probably box this big that goes on the airplane. Um, it's a base station, basically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what I thought of doing today is um, I have, it's a very interactive presentation, I hope. Uh, I'm going to present to you a hypo. Think of it as someone, an inventor, or someone who's starting a new company coming up with this product. And I want to show you what type of IP uh, uh, things you could protect. And then, um, I'm going to be asking questions, getting your answers, helping you kind of figure that out. And then that way, I'm hoping I could tell you, kind of share with you what IP is all about, OK? Um, so this is the area. So imagine someone comes up with this great looking ho hoodie. And the company's name is going to be My Hoodie, right? Um, it, has, uh, it has the special hood. You could zip it down, zip it up. Uh, it has speakers on side the, the hood, so you could put it on, listen to your music. Maybe it has a wireless connection, talks to your cell phone, so you could stream your music from your cell phone. It's even better than that. It has all these sensors, kind of senses how stressed you are. Uh, has some special fabric, maybe some, it, it, it reacts to your senses. If you're stressed, maybe it's going to relax, or maybe it's going to tighten your shoulders, so it kind of massages you as you go. It has a special pattern on the outside. Uh, you know, you look at it from distance, you know this is in my hoodie sweater. Um, maybe it has some LED lights. You could you know, show your mood. If you're being moody, it's going to turn red. If you're being happy, it's going to be green. It has this special kind of uh, uh, wrist you could remove, um, wash. But also it has maybe a fitness tracker on one side. It measures how much you've been walking or how much action you've been having or um, the left side will tell you, you know, how much this, your stress level. So kinda, it's, it's a very high-tech sweater with a hood you could put on, you could zip it, different things. And um, you want to start this company called My Hoodie, right? So what kind of IP can you get out of that? And um, uh, we'll talk about these areas, right? So there's basically five types of IP, copyrights, um, trademarks, Design patents, utility patents, I'll kind of explain the difference between those two, and then trade secrets, right? Um, so the exercise today is to identify what can we protect, and there's going to be some overlap. Some, some stuff you could protect with copyrights, trademarks, and patents. Some stuff is just going to be for patents and, and um, around these areas. And then also I'll talk about how do you plan for protection. So let's say you came up with this hoodie. Who can you talk to? Who should you talk to? Who, how can you make sure that you're not doing something that's going to hurt you long term? Um, and then how you go about that. Um, I have, so I, I have a bunch of thumb drives I'm leaving out, the presentation on it, but I have a bunch of slides that talks about enforcement and litigation that say someone sues you, they have a sweater like this, kind of what do you do? Uh, or if you want to enforce this, you see someone who's making the sweater, what can you do? Um, I could, I'm happy to talk about these, these areas, but um, we could save that for a future presentation or it's on, th on the thumb drive unless you have some questions. Okay? Um, so 
identifying the protectable IP. Um, so copyrights, what is copyrights? It's gonna protect the expression. You know, I have, I have this idea, right? Ideas are not protectable. Anyone can have, we all can have those ideas, right? It's the expression of the idea. So let's say high level, um, it's a story, I have a story about, I don't know, a patent attorney given a presentation. Anyone can write about that. It's, they don't own that idea, right? But it's the way you express, you, the way you describe that, that's what copyright is, right? So you get over literary works, musical works, uh, pictorial, graphics, cultural works, motion pictures, sound recording, architectural works. That's kind of uh, copyright protection that you can get. Um, what does it, and the way copyrights come about is um, when you write, it, when there's a, when it's been written or expressed on some tangible medium, your copyright right exists at that time. So you don't have to go to a lawyer to get a copyright. It does exist at, at that time. There are some um, rules around, you know, if someone else came up with that same expression at the same time, they would also own copyrights over that expression, right? Um, Patrick, I just said uh, architectural works are, mm -hmm. are part of this. And one thing that does happen in the engineering world is sometimes as engineers will create drawings or specifications or something, and then uh, somebody will, will take those and then use them for something else. Is, is, that, is that then in violation of, of, of this copyright protection? Is that, is that it depends that on how you, so um, let's, let's use that, right? So did, is, is the engineer making these drawings because someone asked them to? Are they contracted to some other company to make those? Or are yeah, they- typically, but by an owner. By right, so typically the owner would own those copyrights. Uh, and then if someone else is using those, uh, uh, if, the, if they have permission but from the owner, they're fine. If not, then there's some potential uh, uh, issues there. Um, so what do they control? It's reproducing the work. Um, so I, I cannot make copies. I cannot distribute copies. Um, I cannot perform or display the work publicly. And I cannot make the derivative work. So let's say I come up with a book and then someone kind of runs with that idea, same character, same storyline, but maybe it, it twists to that, they cannot do that. So that, that's what copyrights cannot protect. Do you have to put a statement on there, this is copyrighted? You don't have to, but, uh, so if you wanna sue someone, uh, you wanna register the copyrights with the USPTO at that time, and then that gives notice that this book is copyrightable, so then the type of damages you could get back it's gonna depend on how you have in that inscription or not. But you don't have to, again, work with an attorney or um, uh, have that inscription to have the copyright. Questions so far? Okay. Uh, so things kind of related to my hoodie that you may protect. Um, you know, some patterns, some shapes, some ornamentation on, on different fabric, right? So maybe there's a specific, you know, coloring, patterning that's happening on, on, a, on a piece of fabric. That's copyrightable. Uh, um, again, different patterns, different alignments um, could give you uh, uh, copyright protections. So in this case, uh, what can you get uh, protection on? Uh, so maybe if you look up close to the wrist area, maybe the pattern of, of, of th this is a unique pattern that you came up with, uh, that's copyrightable. Uh, maybe the way the zipper looks on the inside and maybe the way this kind of attaches, again, the, 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 uh, not necessarily the function of that, but the way it looks, that's copyrightable. The pattern- so The way that it looks is going to be copyright? Say again? The way of the looks is going to be copyright? Yeah, you cannot copyright a function. You have to copyright an expression again. Um, so going back, a function is not, so you cannot copyright a phone book, right? A phone book has a bunch of numbers, phone numbers, those are facts, those are, um, they, they have a function. Uh, you cannot copyright that. But if you, let's say you, you have a story about a phone number you called, someone did not answer, that's, that's a different subject, you could copyright that. Specific to this area here, 
again, it, it's the way the pattern, the art, you know, how the shapes, the pattern, the way things look. If that's something unique to you that you came up with, uh, that's copyrightable. Make sense? What if the function depends on the way it looks? You maybe you could get copyrights and a patent. So, so, well, let me give you an example, right? So let's say LED lights, right? You could, a user could change that. Let's say it's a custom, that you have some user interface and you could, you know, change it. You're not getting a copyright on that. Uh, uh, but let's say you provide the patterns and then the user can switch between them. You have copyrights over these uh, patterns. Uh, so what is a trademark? It's, so copyright is the expression, the trademark is the brand, right? It's when someone can see something and says, oh, this came from this company. It, it indicates the source of that good of that product, right? Um, so you could have a copyright over a name, uh, you know, company name, brand name, product name. It could be a logo, or it could be the shape of the good. So the Coca-Cola bottle is a great example, right? Um, again, the key behind cop uh, trademarks is someone looking at that trademark will know where that product came from, right? That's the key. Um, so if you look here, my hoodie, if over time my hoodie becomes, you know, as known as Adidas, these are all these companies, it doesn't matter how you shape that name or the logo, basically, then that name itself is gonna be copyrightable, okay? The shape of it, the logo, maybe those unique circles in it or something like that um, is unique to you, that's also copyrightable. This part here, the, the O-ring, type of shape could be unique to you. And if people over time can see this, if you're putting that logo on, on, on your sweater and people would know that, hey, this came from your company, that's also gonna be copyrightable. Um, copyright or trademark? Excuse me, trademark. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. Um, trademark. Um, and I'll talk about uh, the trademark, the way trademark come about is about the use. When you start using this in commerce, on the product. Again, you don't have to go to a uh, copyright atter uh, trademark attorney to get protection. It's when you put the trademark in use. Now, when you wanna go enforce it, you wanna register this trademark. And there's issues around uh, where that trademark is, the product it's being used, where that trademark is being used. And there's some, many advantages, and I'll talk about that, to file the trademark with the USPTO. It gives you national coverage it gives you, uh, it puts others on notice that you have a trademark and stuff like that. So there's benefits to working with an attorney to get a trademark. It gives you, again, national coverage, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But you say even if you don't go through your lawyer, you still have protection? You have protection. Typically, so if you're using this trademark on a product, you have protection in the market where you are in, right? So let's say I come up with my hoodie I use it on sweater in Seattle, and someone else comes, comes up with my hoodie and uses it in some product in Miami. We both have trademarks over my, my hoodie. I have it in, my, in Seattle, he, ha, he, she has it in Miami. Uh, but if I got my hoodie here first, went to the SPTO, registered that trademark, then I have national protection. No one else can use my hoodie on a sweater or article of clothing in the US. Is the trademark on the name or on the look of the name? Both. Could be the name, could be the logo itself, could be, which I'll show in the next slide, could be on the, on the shape of, of the object. Could it be on both? Could be, yes, both. I mean, you could get protection, the name, the logo, the shape, all three together. Um, so examples of product designs on the shape, the Coca-Cola bottle, that's a trademark. No one else, Pepsi cannot use that. The Jawbone Museum packaging, if you've bought you know, the, the earphones and they come in a, this nice package with the glass kind of top looking or transparent part, that's trademark um, to Jawbone. Cartier, love bracelet, that's trademarked. Uh, so no one is supposed to make that type of piece of jewelry with that shape. Um, other trademarks related to kind of fabrics, 
Levi's has a trademark over uh, its stitching in, on the jeans. Burberry, whenever you see a Burberry, kind of that pattern, you know it, it's from Burberry, so, so that's a trademark. Uh, Tiffany boxes, the blue box, shoes with the red sole. Um, not my area completely, but um, apparently it's a trademark. So, so shoes with red soles? Yeah, they're Lou, I don't know, Lou Bouton? Is that, I don't know, but that's a trademark. That's a fake, people looking at those shoes would know it came from that company. Right. I mean, so, so you see a shoes with red, do you know what they are, right? Yeah. That, that's the trademark. Not that any of you guys would know. Uh, <laughs> right, so, so going back to our hypo here, so let's say you put your My Hoodie logo here on the shirt. If over time people would know that this came from My Hoodie, that's a trademark. Um, the My Hoodie is a makeup name because for presentation was the real. Well, it's, it's a makeup name. Okay. Uh, Maybe there's, maybe it's other, I don't know, but no, no, no it's a makeup name. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it's fair use, it's just for presentation and uh, there are exceptions to every, everything we may do. So uh, so again, it could be the logo itself, my hoodie, uh, could be just the, the this insignia here. Um, as long as it's attached to a product, I cannot uh, get a trademark over my hoodie in the absolute, it has to be related to a product. Article of clothing, uh, computers, what have you. It just has to be tied to a product. So let's say um, I have, you know, let's say this is Adidas, right? Someone can go and make a car called Adidas. They're not, they will not be infringing on the Adidas trademark because it's, it's on a product that is a car versus article of clothing. Apple computer. Apple computer. There's, Apple right. So they're never going to do the same thing. That's right. No, there's a limit to that. There's something called famous trademarks or famous brands. Uh, there's a theory called dilution, uh, trademark dilution. If you know using that name in different areas will dilute the value of that trademark, then you're in trouble. But again, there's a different case. It, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, but uh, let's see. Other stuff you could trademark, again, if you see it kind of like the red soles, right? If you see this pattern and you could not, oh, this is a my hoodie sweater, that's trademarkable and it's copyrightable too. So, so you're getting protection uh, in both. And the same thing, let's say those wrists, removable wrists are something unique to you and people look at it and say, no, it's my hoodie. You're getting a trademark if you want to on that, so. Okay, um, moving to design patterns. So, so the design pattern is gonna protect uh, the way an object looks, the way the, a product would look. So you could get a trademark and a, um, and a design patent uh, uh, on the same product. Uh, it's gonna give you 15 years uh, of term. So trademarks would last uh, uh, for the life of the product, the life of the company using that product. So it doesn't, doesn't have a lifetime, it could be infinite. Uh, assuming the company will exist forever, uh, but a design patent will have a 15 years term. If you think back in a couple of years ago, Samsung versus Apple, they were fighting over a design patent, the way the, the rounded corner, corner of a smartphone, that was a fight over a design patent. Um, so design patents are very relevant, they're becoming more relevant today, uh, given the recent history. Um, but they give you, again, another layer of protection for the way things look. Not their function, but the way things look. Um, what, what protection does that provide for international? So it's very, uh, IP is very localized, so you'll get a protection in the US. Again, depending on the type of IP you're going after, but typically you got a protection in the US, and if you want to go overseas, you have to file uh, overseas too. So I know, for example, for patents, which I work on mostly, um, you file a US application, then you could go to something called a PCT application. So you go basically internationally, and then off that, then you have to file in all the different uh, uh, countries you wanna go in. The problem with that is it gets a little bit expensive 
and, and you know, fast. So think of cost in the US, mm -hmm. take that, time it by 10 if you're going in 10 different places. Um, that, that's honestly the biggest problem, but there's no one system where you file an application and then you get protection all over the world. It's, it's, it's all very localized. You mentioned all the time that the design pattern is just shape of that, not function. Why you mentioned the function is not patented? Because that's the utility pattern. Oh. So it's a different type of protection. Um, again here, so the way maybe the hoodie looks, uh, maybe the way the, the wrists look, uh, the wrists look, the way that the pattern looks, that, that could be part of your design pattern. So again, for this stuff, you're getting uh, copyright, trademark, and design. So you're not limited to one, but you could get protection in three areas. You mentioned if you got 10 throughout the world. I mean, the United States is obviously mm -hmm. a big one. European Union, is that, would that be? Yeah, that? so there's, EP, you file an EP app, but then once you get through the EPO, uh, um, you have to also go national. So you have to designate certain countries, so France, Germany, England, all these other countries, and there's fees that you have to pay in each of these. Uh, there's China is big, uh, Japan, Korea are big. Um, it, de it depends on kind of the product that you make. Because again, so with, with patents, for example, it's going to protect, um, it's going to protect against import. If you file a patent in the U.S., it's going to protect against imports uh, of that product, in the, you know, making, using, selling, or importing that product into the U.S. So let's say you, you make, um, um, you know it's going to be made in China and imported in the U.S. You file an application here in the U.S., then you block someone else from importing it, right? And then if you file an application in China, then you, in theory, you could stop the Chinese from making it unless, you know, they get a license from you. So, uh, so it depends on kind of what your product is and where it can be made. Uh, where does the burden of proof on determining whether a design is unique, does that fall on whoever files the pattern, or does it fall on the USPDO? Uh, so it falls on it falls on the USPDO, and then it shifts to you, right? So you what the way this happens, and I, we, I have some slides on that. Uh, but you file an application, and then the USPTO will get to an examiner, USPTO examiner. Uh, he she is going to look at prior art, so any other existing designs out there in the same area, and they're going to come back and say, "Well, hold on a second. You know, I have I have." Um, there's another application uh, by someone else, let's say, or some other images somewhere, right, that show um, a similar pattern. Maybe, it, maybe this is LEDs, right, and, and you could color it, all that stuff, but from a design perspective, it just doesn't matter. It's, it's a pattern, right? Um, so maybe it's a, they, they see someone who's making a sweater that has that pattern but doesn't have any of the functions, but it, but it looks the same. So they're going to come back and say, hey, I found this. You are the same, you don't get a design patent. And then the burden shifts on us to go back and say, no, hold on a second, we're, we're a little bit different. Here's why we're different. And if you can convince the examiner, then you get a patent. If not, then we could change the application a little bit and then make it different, and then you could get a patent. But the burden, burden is on the USPTO first, and then it shifts to us uh, through prosecution. Okay? Questions so far? Uh, so, Okay, so everything I've said so far, that's, well, not everything. Trademark copyrights is kind of what we call soft IP. So typically you don't need, um, you could be, you don't need to have the technical background to be able to be in a, you know, a practice in that area of law. Uh, design patents, you probably do need a, a, um, a technical degree. For utility patent, you have to be either an engineer or have a technical degree to be, a, to be able to practice in this area of law. And the reason for that, it's, it's very technical. It, it's going to go after the function. Uh, and it gets very complicated very fast. Um, that's kind of where I spend most of my practice. That's 80% of what I do is, is in this area. Uh, so what is a utility? And that's going to, I'm very biased <laughs> because I practice in this area. But that's where really where the value is in terms of IP protection. Um, it gives you the best protection. if you have a function you want to protect, right? Uh, but it's also the most expensive to get. Um, you know, it's getting a utility patent is expensive. And uh, once you get it maintaining it, because you have to pay maintenance fees to the ESPTO, is also expensive. Uh, but it gives you, 
very good protection. Um, so what can you get a utility patent on? It's for something that is new, useful, and non-obvious. Uh, so new could be no one else has, made, has done this before. Uh, useful, it has to have a purpose. That threshold is very low, that bar is very low. Like anything could be useful, almost. Non-obvious means if you, if an engineer looks at some art, prior art, and figures out a way to put two things together or multiple things together and derive your invention, then that's obvious. But if it's something, so there's some crazy creative aspect that someone else could not put these pieces together, then it's non-obvious. So you ha we have, once we examine, once we start prosecuting with the USPTO, we have to convince, if they reject us, we have to convince them that we're new, easy, useful, easy, but also non-obvious. Because typically they, they'll go out there and let's say, um, well, let's say, let's say I'm the first one who ever invented the house, just for the sake of example, right? Um, four walls, a roof made of, let's say, concrete or what have you, right? Uh, but people have lived in caves forever and maybe they've built tents in the past, right? So the examiner is gonna come, go back and say, hey, look, caves are made of solid material. People have lived in tents, they have walls and roofs. It's obvious to put them together and now you have a house. So we have to kind of go back and say, no, hold on a second, it's not obvious for these reasons. Or maybe we explain, well, it's not only that, but we have a door, we have a window, we have a fire escape, da, da. then you, you, know, you kind of change a little bit and then you get a pattern on that. But kind of that, that's the notion uh, behind it. Uh, so you got 20 years from the time you filed the application. Uh, again, it doesn't give you the right to make things. It gives you the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, uh, whatever you have a patent on. Um, okay, some, some requirements. Um, so you have to be an inventor. You cannot steal the, the, the invention from someone else. Um, again, useful, novel, non-obvious. Um, in the old days, we kind of talked about it a little bit on, on uh, the, uh, during dinner is, you could almost patent anything, including e-commerce related stuff. Things have changed recently. There's a case law that went to the Supreme Court back in 2014, and it made things a little bit harder, but you cannot, you still can patent a lot of stuff, but you cannot patent what we call abstract ideas. You cannot say, hey, I'm gonna, uh, you know, trading, right? If I'm gonna take, I'm gonna measure how much risk there is in the market, uh, or I'm gonna have a computer, program a computer to measure the risk and tell me what the stock price is, the USP is gonna look at that application and say, huh, eh, that's, that's, that's an abstract idea. People have been doing that for ages. Yeah, you're doing it on, on a computer, but that's, that's what computers are for. That's abstract, so. Uh, so, but mainly, you know, anything, a process machine, article, you know, the way you make things, a machine, the product itself, um, go, you know, for chemical people, composition of matter is a big thing, so. Um, but you could get patent on almost, still almost anything unless it's an abstract idea, unless it's, it's too broad, too generic, uh, stuff like that. Um, right, uh, you must, this, this bullet doesn't do justice, but I see that very often with um, you know, solo inventors or new inventors. You have to file things on time. Luckily in the US we got a one year grace period where if you go out and tell someone about your invention w without an NDA, you get one year to file your application. If you don't file an application without a year, it doesn't matter what you do, you lost your right to your patent because you made a public disclosure, okay? So, so do, you preclude, do you preclude other people from getting a patent when you do that? No, you don't preclude other people. If, if, if I do something that's unique, I don't patent it after a year. Right. Can somebody else come along a year and a day and patent it? If you've published something on it, yes, because then that'll be used as prior art against them. But if you just, it, it wasn't published, then it's not gonna count against them. Um, so I wrote an article about it, published it, then right. I protected? You, you're not protected, you've blocked others from using that idea. <coughs> Uh, they can still use it that if they have improvements over what you've published, they could protect or get IP over those that, that, that 
the improvements that they've made. Um, question or? How does it work? You said they can add a, an improvement to it. So say I come up with a product, and then somebody comes to that product, and they're like, oh, look, I added a swing out ruler to this product. I'm going to make this my own product and sell it. Can you come back and be like, hey, you took my product and slapped a ruler on it that's infringement upon? So do you have, do you have, a, do you have a patent over your, your product? Yeah, okay. So then what would happen is they would be infringing on your product because they, they're using it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, if they get IP over the extra widget that they made, then no one else, like if you start using that widget, you'll be infringing on, yeah. all right. Uh, so then in that case, like it would be best to like get a cross license where you give them license to your product and then you, or your IP on that product and then they get a license back or you got a license back for using the widget. Uh, but there's nothing, I mean, you could get protection on yours, they could get protection on theirs, you could fight it and you know, you're gonna be hurting each other long term if, if that widget helps sell your product. Um, but yeah. What happens if prior art is found later? Right. So there's a bunch of stuff could happen. Uh, so you could go back to the USPTO. There's procedures called post grant reviews. There's a number of procedures. It all depends on the timing when that comes about. Um, but you could go to the SPTO and say, hey, you got a patent on this. I found this art. That patent is invalid. Right. So then the USPTO will look at that stuff. You're going to have to present arguments and they're going to say, yep, you're right. That patent is invalid. So then it's just invalid, it, it, it's, it has no value. Or you could go to court and do the same. Uh, uh, and it's a common, whenever there's a litigation case, I would 99% of the time, there's gonna argue, we do always do a search to find prior art and we'll find prior art. And then there's an argument over, is this, are the claims invalid or the patent invalid because of that prior art? Um, and that's kind of where honestly the good lawyering comes, um, but that's, I can guarantee you 99% of the time that's happening in any litigation or, or even licensing uh, uh, negotiation. Um, what's the definition for a band? Is if they publish an article about something and they don't do anything about it for a year, is that considered a band? Yeah, so there are two ways you could, so you publish something uh, and then a year goes by, you don't do anything. Uh, it's now in the public domain. You've abandoned your basically rights to get a patent on that. Or you file an application, you're prosecuting with the USPTO, um, they tell you you don't have a patent yet and then you abandon the application, then it's abandoned. You lost your right to that application. So you cannot come back. Again, depends on the circumstances. In that situation, typically you cannot come back and revive the application. Uh, so you lost your rights to it. Do you have one year to file the patent so it's being adjudicated beyond a year? So, so let me kind of re rephrase that. So if you made a public disclosure, if, if I today came to you and said, hey, look at, no one has a mouse before. I invented this mouse. I have a year to file an application on that, right? But let's say I, I've been working on this in my lab or in my garage for 10 years and no one has seen it. It's not public disclosure. I could, I haven't. The, star, the clock doesn't start ticking yet. The moment I disclose this publicly to one individual, that's enough for the clock to start ticking. Now, if you want to disclose things, you could always like, if you have an NDA in place, then that's not a public disclosure, so the clock doesn't start ticking. The problem with NDA is that I've seen, um, and that kind of leads into litigation, is you have an NDA with a big company, uh, you think you're safe, and then I go around and I start making that product and or file an application on that product and I beat you to the SPTO just because they have the budget, the money, the people. Um, I, so I'm not discouraging you from having NDAs, but just be careful that, you know, who you're talking to because NDAs sometimes is, is not gonna give you the protection. You're gonna have to kind of fight that um, in court or something. Questions so far? Okay, uh, one last thing too. Uh, so, not to skip over this bullet, but when you file an application, you cannot, the, the standard there is you have to make, 
you have to describe the invention in a way that a person of ordinary skill in the art, so an engineer out there who knows this technology, is going to be able to go and build whatever you're saying your, your product is, right? So you cannot say, hey, I want to build a rocket to the moon. It's going to have a body, a whatever, an engine, and take some fuel, right? That's not enough. You're going to have to describe how, you know, what's in the body, what type of fuel you use, all, all kind of the details that would let lead someone to, uh, to kind of be, look at that document and go out and build, build that uh, product. And the, 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 the notion behind that is, okay, we're going to give you a monopoly for 20 years over this piece of technology, right? But when that 20 years is done, anyone in the public should be able to use this technology, right? So we want you to disclose enough for the public to be able to use it. In return, we're going to give you 20 years of monopoly over that technology. Um, the, again, the point here is if, whether you're drafting the application yourself or you're draft, working with some attorney, and um, just well, you want to be careful that you describe, you have enough technical description of, uh, in the application about what your invention is. Okay. Uh, so what is kind of, if you haven't seen a pattern before, I'll just give you some, what the pieces of that is. So um, you have a cover page that's going to give you uh, the title, the, who the inventor is, if there's a company that this is assigned to, um, when this was filed, uh, when it became public, when the USPTO published it, when did you get the patent, your number there. And then also a short abstract and other information. Um, the patent also includes a bunch of figures. Uh, How many patents are filed in a year? I don't know the exact number, but uh, we're close to a 10 million patent in today's world. And this is counting from 1800 and on. I would say, I mean, there's so. The USPTO cannot hire enough examiners to keep up with the pace of applications. Um, Is it more and more applications every year? Yeah, it's, it's going up. Uh, there's a huge bottleneck. That's why I said, you know, we filed an application two years go by, you don't hear back from the USPTO just because they don't have enough examiners to look at the stuff. I, I don't know. My first application is 2012. It's not finished yet. Well, that, there's a difference between, yes, so you filed in sometime then it takes two years before you get anything back from the USPTO and then any, any time there's a touch from the USPTO it's a six month cycle yeah. uh, so if, if you have multiple touches it takes a long time I filed my application in 2006 when I was back at Boeing and I got it in 2014 my first patent so I had left Boeing and I got my patent luckily Boeing sent me a check which was like oh my gosh you guys are awesome you don't have to, but uh, thank you. Um, really, they sent a check? Yeah, they sent. They paid us when we filed the application, and I pay you when you get the patent. Uh, and and did they pay you to develop the idea? Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah, so does it belong to them? Well, it's assigned to them. It does belong to them, but I'm the inventor on it. Okay. Uh, so when does the when does the year start? When you get the patent, or when you apply for it? When you apply for it. That's 20 years from that point on. Now, there is something called extend, uh, ETAs. So it's not 20 years per se. It's 20 years plus any delays caused by the USPTO that's going to be added to your term. Uh, and now, if you look at here, let's see, maybe you'll see it. Uh, well, this doesn't have it. Uh, yeah, well, it does. 1,051 days extra. You see that? If you add that to uh, the filing date is... June 23rd, 2007, ten, 20 years plus a thousand days, that's when this will expire. And all that, all that is delayed, is delayed from the SPTO. Um, you could have delays because of the attorney, but that doesn't extend the term of the patent. Okay, I'm just gonna walk them through that. Um, again, you'll have a spec, it's gonna describe what this invention is, it's gonna have, it's gonna tell you, tell the public what field this is in. Uh, not required, but it could tell or explain what, what other art exists, you know, the existing systems, what they do and why you're different. The summary, then a list of the drawings, and then you go into your detailed description. Uh, but the core of this, the essence of this is the end of the patent, but the claims. 
Um, so let me spend a little bit more time. So think of it, the, the patent is it's, it's a property right, right? So if, if you compare that to your deed, right? When you go buy a house, the deed's gonna maybe, I don't know, show, have, you know, photos of, your, of the house, right? Those are the figures. It's gonna maybe have a title, you know, or it's gonna identify you. You're the inventor, you're the owner, right? Maybe it's gonna show some taxes, it's gonna say, it describe the house, it's made of whatever, bricks and all that stuff. That's kind of the, the spec itself. But in the deed, it's gonna say, you own the property between, you know, between point A to point B, point B to point C, point C to point A. That's, that's your property border, that's what you own. That's what the claims do. They tell, you know, you describe everything, but then the, the claims are gonna tell the public Here's the piece of here's the border of the technology that I own, right? Um, so when we prosecute with the USPTO, they're gonna look at the claims and say, hold on a second, no, you know, A, B, and C, well, A and B are found in this prior art, and C is in this prior art. Well, it's obvious to put them together, and now you have A, B, C in the prior art. So you don't, you haven't invented something. It's it's already out in the public, uh, in the in the in the public. So we're not gonna give you a patent on this, right? So we come back and say, well, hold on a second. We're gonna, given the support, the, given the description uh, of the invention, we're gonna add a D point. So now we're from A to B, B to C, C to D, D to A, right? And maybe that's enough to get you, make, make a difference, right? So going back to the example, you know, I'm the first one, I thought I'm the first one who invented the house, right? What if they come back and find, people have been living in castles, castles are like houses, right? Then maybe, you know, I add, well, my house is, you know, has windows or glass doors or what have you. Maybe that's kind of what makes, makes a difference. And then you could get a patent on that, okay? But the whole notion here is uh, the spec, the figures are going to describe the technology. Your legal rights are going to be in the claims. It's a short list of stuff. It's a short list of features. It's going to say, you know, these are the features that I have legal rights over as, a, as an inventor. Uh, if you've read this, um, so claims are typically very cryptic, uh, but if you've read this claim, what these guys are getting protection on is, on your phone, I think they could track how your move, movement is, your gate signature, and they could identify if it's you or if it's someone else using your phone. That's what this technology is about. Um, so depending on how you you, um, you move that could determine if you have an authorized user of the phone or not. So there's some signature that have stored your gate profile on the phone and they monitor how you walk. And if, if that, the way you walk is different, then they know you're not the authorized user and maybe they, maybe they lock the phone or something like that. So iPhone 10, you unlocked with your face. This phone, you could unlock it by walking the right way, I guess. Um, but that's, that's what this claim is for, okay? Uh, wrong way. So again, so going back to our hypo, what can we get a patent, utility patent over, right? Remember, we have stereos in our hoodies. Has anyone, you know, have you ever seen a hoodie with stereos? No, probably not, so maybe you could get that. We could get a patent on, on, on that. We're gonna fight with the USPTO because they're gonna say, well, hoodies exist, stereos exist. There's nothing new, you, it's obvious. Someone is, it's so easy to combine them, right? Maybe then we have an inspect something that explains the interface, how you put the speakers, uh, you know, how you attach them to the hoodie and maybe some wireless interface. Maybe how you, you know, you have to, you have to power up these speakers. Maybe how you get the power into these speakers. Maybe that's kind of what makes it unique and not obvious, right? So we'll bring that feature into the claim and claim that. So then we'll have a right over, you know, hoodie, speaker, and a unique way, whatever that way may be to power or to charge these, these speakers, right? Um, sensors that monitor your stress level. We could get a pattern on that maybe. Um, detachable wrists. Yeah, there's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not high tech, but maybe detachable wrist on, on, a, on a sweater. Maybe that's something that you can get a pattern on. Again, maybe LEDs here and the way you control the LEDs or maybe the fabric that kind of changes its stiffness to kind of make you relax or not 
we could get a pattern on that. Um, so different areas, again, the function here, think of the function, you know, um, getting audio onto your, in your hoodie, that's the speakers, you know, being able to change the, the stiffness of the fabric, uh, removable, attachable parts, um, you know, monitor your stress level, your, your heartbeat, all that stuff, those functions, that's what, that's what we're going after in the utility patent. Make sense so far? All right, so last area of technology is trade or IP is trade secrets. So trade secrets is anything that has value. It, it's a secret. Mm -hmm. It's anything that has a value, right? And that you're, you make reasonable effort to keep as a secret, right? Um, the, you, you, again, you don't have to, you, well, you don't have to, you cannot get a trade secret by working with it. It's either you have it or not. The attorneys will help you to set it up. So, you know, set up your processes so you could protect your secrets and get a trade secret. But you don't have to work with the USPTO or work with an attorney to get a trade secret. As long as you make a reasonable effort um, to protect your information and that information has some value, then you have a trade secret. Um, it's again very localized, very depends on the states you're in. Um, law will change. Um, uh, so, again, two criteria should have a value, and also you're making an effort to keep it as a secret. Coca Cola, the formula has been protected since 19, I don't know, 40 or something, whatever, whenever Coca Cola came about, but only two people know of the formula. and. It's kept in a safe somewhere. Yeah, so that, that I mean, it's, it's a trade secret. And it's been there since, you know, early 1900s. Um, they file it as a secret? Huh? They file it? No, it's not filed. You, again, it's, it's, it's protected. It's complete secrecy, right? Uh, if someone reverse engineers the Coca-Cola formula, too bad. It's no longer a trade secret. Uh, so if you, you can figure out, go for it. Um, if you disclose it by mistake, um, it's now in the public domain. You cannot trade, get it, you know, you cannot protect it as a trade secret anymore. Um, so what, what, would, what can you get with trade secrets? So anything, also anything that, um, the way I, I like to think about it, if, if it, there's no value in getting a utility, or you cannot get a utility patent, or maybe, Getting utility patent would not give you much value because let's say it's a process that it's hard to figure out if someone else is doing it. It's kind of like a process that is run in the background. Let's say, think of it as a server, right? And the server is doing all this background processing and it's hard to figure out if your competitor is going to be doing that or not. Then maybe, maybe you know, and, and if they look at your servers and they cannot figure out what you're exactly doing, maybe keep it as a trade secret, right? You don't try to get a utility, utility patent on. Um, but everything else, you know, anything that, you know, test trackers, drawings, any business plans, all that stuff, that's trade secret, you know, you could keep it as a trade secret. So let's say, let's say I start making these designs plans for my hoodie, right? Um, and I, I kind of have all these projections of how much, you know, money I'm going to make, what's the price point, uh, where I'm going to source all my fabrics from, who's going to stitch the stuff from, my contacts, all that stuff. I can keep that as trade secret. I don't have to disclose that stuff. If I make a reasonable effort to keep them as a secret um, and some, some employee take them and starts his own My Hoodie company, then I could sue him for trade secret uh, misappropriation. If okay. you sue someone for trade secret misappropriation, do you have to mm -hmm. trade secret? Uh, well, that, assuming that it's already been uh, I mean, you're suing because I disclosed what what um, that took from you. So it's part of it is in the public domain, um, but also part what you could do is you could protect. I mean, it, you'll have to reveal it to the court, but it's uh, it's going to be uh, protected in the court. So everything will be redacted. Um, you don't have to reveal more than what's out there in the public. Um, what if something that's been used as a trade secret by somebody else then gets patented? Okay, so, so I'm using a trade secret yes. and you get a patent. Yes. Uh, Later. Right. Uh, that's fine. So my trade secret is not in public domain, so you could get a, you could get a patent on that. And let's say you get a patent on that and you come back and say, hey, uh, 
uh, you're using my um, you, you're using my I found out that you're using my technology. There's uh, so I'm at risk of infringement, but also there's a theory um, or there's a defense where you could say I've been using this technology before you have, and I have um, forgot the exact terms for it, but it's like you have some inherent license to that technology. So uh, so you could still get an exception from being an infringer, but you're at a risk and you're going to have to fight that. Um, but doesn't that fall into the domain of someone reverse engineering and it's no longer a trade secret in that case? Or? Uh, again, it's going to depend on the technology. What you're, you know, if, your trade secret, if your trade secret is a, is a bunch of phone numbers that your contacts and where you're sourcing the stuff, you're not getting a pattern on that. But it's, let's say it's the process, you know, some, again, server process running in the background that looks at whatever, uh, all this user activity and figure out if there's some, you know, fraudulent activity happening. And I end up patenting that and you've been using it for some time and I could prove that I've been using it, then I probably, I'll be accepted from being uh, an infringer. The other part of this, you could keep it trade secret for, let's say, 10 years, and then decide that it's time for me to file a utility application on or patent, and then you could do that. So there's nothing, mm. nothing that prohibits you from doing that. Um, if I have this right, the very fact that you keep it a trade secret means that it's not prior art. But it's so not in the public domain. Yeah. So therefore, a prior art claim against the against the new patent filed by someone else is valid because it's a trade secret. There, so there is, the, the, the more relevant issue is honestly, um, have I given this, have I put, did I put that in the public domain, right? If I put that in the public domain, I only have one year to file an application on. So if, if my trade secret has been out for longer than that, then it doesn't matter. It, it's just in the public domain now, it doesn't matter so again, I'm talking about if someone else files a patent okay. that, that is basically your trade secret. All right. You can't invalidate the patent. No, you cannot. It's because not, right. simply we could have made the trade secret not. Right, you right. You cannot use that uh, against them because it's your trade secret. It's not in the public domain. Yeah. Questions so far? Okay, planning for IP protection. Uh, how are we doing on time, by the way? Probably at nine. It's yeah. at nine o'clock right now, so we'll probably need to wrap it up fairly quickly. Okay. I'll go quickly through some slides. Uh, copyrights again. Uh, uh, you don't. It exists from the time you you express it on a tangible medium. You should get get it registered if you want to sue someone. Get it registered. Uh, trademarks. Different levels of trademarks. There's. Um, the strongest versus the, the, the least uh, or the weakest. Um, so coin terms, so terms that you invent, they don't mean anything. If you open a dictionary, there's no dictionary definition. Those could get a trademark right away. Uh, arbitrary terms, so terms that exist, but they, you know, let's say, again, Joe Bond for fitness, like if you look at Joe Bond, it, it, it's not gonna, it's dictionary definition is not gonna be uh, related to fitness tracker. Um, so that, that gives you also immediate trademark protection. Suggestive, if you take a term and you, that term could suggest whatever the product is, Fitbit, right? It's, it's something that is fit, that is small, all that stuff. Um, that also would give you, uh, that, that will give you a trademark. The descriptive term, uh, that will give you a trademark, so let's say, um, Shot tracker. It, it describes what this is doing. It's not suggesting it. It actually describes what it's doing. You you'll get a trademark, except uh, you're gonna have to wait for a few years until consumers can come back. Or until you have evidence that consumers, when they see sh shot tracker, whatever that description is, will associate that description with with your product. Right. These three will almost immediately or will immediately get you a trademark. This one here will get you a trademark after some time, and you could prove that. People associate the, the description with your product, and then generic terms are, are terms that will not get a trademark on. So it doesn't matter how hard you try, uh, you know, wearable. You cannot get a trademark on a, on a product called wearable. Wearable devices, it's generic. Uh, 
Again, uh, uh, trademarks are, you get them for using them. Um, you could, if you don't use them, you could still, uh, there's something called intent to use. Uh, so you don't have, if you're thinking to start, like, I'm saying, thinking to start my hoodie, I don't have in my hoodie product out there, but I intend to use it, uh, I could get a registration of that trademark. Um, and also, registration will give you national coverage. Uh, I'll skip through those. Uh, design patterns, again, are relatively expensive, uh, quick to get uh, with the USPTO. Uh, let's skip through that. All right. Uh, the back and forth. You've been playing a tennis match for a long time. Uh, it, it's so. Uh, I work with you guys, you give me your invention, a month later we file it, two years later we get the first office act, first what we call office action from the USPTO, back and forth, back and forth, every time I hit the ball, it's going to take six months to get the ball back, it takes years, we get it, uh, eventually, uh, and then er everything we say during that match game could be used against us when we're either litigating or something, so let's say, let's say the widget, the we have a claim for a widget, and we say the widget is a specific da, da, da Then when we go, when we're in litigation, if the infringer isn't that specific, whatever we said, they're gonna come back and say, well, you said the widget here is this plate with the cup with the whatever, and the infringer is only using the plate without the cup, then uh, they're gonna be off the hook, so. Uh, timing again, as soon as, before you disclose this to anyone, um, get a pat file a patent application, don't get a patent, file a patent application. There's different types of patent applications, utility, there's a provisional application. Um, I think this is, I'll, I'll con conclude with this, but um, the best way to protect yourself, uh, especially if you're starting a business and then maybe you don't have enough budget yet, um, there's something called a provisional application, right? So basically you can take a technical paper and file it with the USPTO. You don't have to f have claims. You don't have to have any fancy drawings. Take that paper, file it to the SPTO. Uh, if you use a lawyer, it's minimal effort on our behalf. It's just uh, pushing the paper to the SPTO. What that, what that does to you is it gives you a year to what we call convert that application into a full, app a non-provisional application, right? So in that year, you could go out and talk to people. It doesn't matter, you have protected yourself. This is now with the USPTO, right? So you could mention it, you could go get investment, uh, all that stuff. At the end of that year, then we could, you could spend the money if you decide that, well, it's worth the money. It's gonna cost me $10,000 to file a non-provision application. I have 10K in my pocket. Then you could work with an attorney to kind of convert that uh, uh, into a full application. So it gives you better protection than NDA. Uh, and it gives you a year to think about it. Um, and then, then you could spend the money at that time uh, to do a full non provision I could talk for ages. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more than this, but uh, happy to take any questions now or um, um, Looking around, did I answer so all your questions? Or yeah, we can yeah. call your office later. <laughs> Anytime you want. They're going to charge us a question. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could work for free, but uh, I work for a firm, and uh, we're not also awesome. we're not cheap. But the way I mean, the way I think of it, right? If you're if you're if you're have a headache, right? Fine, get a get an aspirin, go get a over an over the counter prescription. We're fine. You're gonna be fine. If you're having a heart attack, you know, go to Swedish, right? Go to somewhere where that could treat you. Again, if you're just doing IP for the fun of it, do it yourself. But if you really are gonna build a business around this and either are gonna be sued or gonna be suing people or trying to get a license, you know, something that is gonna bring money, um, you as the professionals. I mean, there's so much in the law. There's so many little details. Yeah. Unless you're very careful, you're gonna. You mentioned that when the provisional uh, pattern is 12 months, mm -hmm. then we have to add a number. If you not do that, that would happen. So what happens is you file this provisional, right? It goes, it goes to the SPDO, it's not examined by the SPDO, it's not open to the public, right? If in a year you don't 
do anything, it, think of it as it disappears. No one knows about it, no one has seen it. Uh, so if within that year you didn't disclose, you didn't say anything to anyone, you could refile it again and get another year and keep doing that over and over and over, right? But if you, at some point in time you've disclosed something, then um, again, that's, you're going to have a year from that point on. But filing the provision will give you a year. Again, if you don't say anything, keep going, keep going, keep going until you have the money or you decide it's time for it. Um, and then you file a non-provisional. Or if you file a provisional six months and you disclose something, then you have six months from that point or a year from that point on to either file a full provisional or six months within that to convert the first one. Now the advantage of, it, it not only gives you protection against, um, or, or buys you a year, but also it gives you what we call a priority date. So the prior art, whatever the USPL is gonna use against you as prior art is gonna to date to, the, to that filing date of the provisional application. So if I file a provisional application today and I, in a year convert, when I prosecute this with the USPO, they cannot use any public documents that dates between now and uh, uh, you know November of next year. So, so I I built the perfect widget. I submitted the application, started the process. I being a entrepreneur and inventor and engineer know that I can improve on the widget and produce widget 2.0. Mm -hmm. What does that do to the original application? Different, there's great question. There's different ways you could approach this. On a very high level, got a good lawyer. Uh, <laughs> but so there's something, there's a procedure called, there's an application called continuation in part, CIP. Okay, so what you do is you take that first application, you add new material to it, okay? You add the improvements to it, right? So on that, then you file it again as a second application called CIP off the first one. So what happens is, so that's, this is your first one, let's say dates to 2017, right? This is the set next one dates 2018, right? So when the US bill is examining the claims of this one, anything that has support in the old one, well, the prior art will be 2017 and prior. Anything that, any claim to the improvements will have, they could apply um, uh, prior art from 2018 and on. So, so let's say, your widget has feature A, feature B, and feature C, right? A and B are in the first application. C is the improvement. When the USPO is examining this, if, if, um, if you know, A is not in the prior art uh, because it has a 2017 date, no one before 2017 came up with this, but B and C are, right? And your improvement apparently is obvious. You're still fine because you have the A, the hook on A, you don't have prior art against that. Um, uh, that being said, also, if you get, and I've done that, honestly, with, um, with uh, Caltech. Uh, they came up, I'm not going to say much, but they have a medical device. And a uh, simple device kind of moves oxygen from one part of the body, puts it in a different part of the body. And uh, we found an application on that. Uh, we got a patent. Uh, and then I figured out that there were having issues with condensation inside the tube that is moving the oxygen. The water was building up. It's not moving the oxygen in the way that should be moving the oxygen. Um, so what we decided to do is do a CIP, but also we filed what we call a continuation application. We filed that same application again. It has the priority date of 2015 when we filed the application. And the way we claim this, we had claims A, B, and C, we removed claim C, so now it's A and B. And we believe that we have enough over the prior art with A and B only, right? So now when we have an infringer, they don't have to have C anymore. They don't, have this, they don't need to use a specific um, filling inside the tube, right? So it doesn't matter what type of tube you have or filling you have, if they're moving oxygen between these two points given whatever those points are, then they're gonna be infringing on us. Uh, so that kind of we again we they made an improvement in terms of the specific filling. We have we're gonna we're filing an application on that. We're gonna claim that, but also we filed a, a broader application where it doesn't matter what filling you have, you're still infringing. So let's go ahead and um, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.